Welcome to Plastic Model Mojo, a podcast dedicated to scale modeling, as well as the news and events around the hobby, where we hope to be informative and entertaining and help you keep your modeling mojo alive. Welcome back, listeners. Dave and I are enjoying some good modeling weather at the time of this recording because much of Kentucky is enduring a moderate ice storm at the moment. However, we seem to be getting along all right. We hope you enjoy this episode as Dave and I discuss the uniforms of the Red Army during the World War II period. So let's get into that and jump into episode 31 of Plastic Model Mojo. Well, welcome back again, Dave. Uh, we've gotten through January of 2021. We're uh, we're now in a new month. How's it going? Yeah, not too bad, Mike. Uh you know, this February is the month I hate the most. I don't like winter. It's the coldest. It's uh, it's just a bleak month. And uh, with work picking up after the new year, I'm having trouble finding the time that I need to make. Uh, so it's kind of pinching on my mojo here and there. How about you? Well, unfortunately, we lost a close friend in our social circle a couple of weeks ago and, and finally are wrapping up all the services around that. He was a very selfless and very generous person. And I just think some of the feedback we've gotten on this podcast has, has made me think uh, of the way all of us think of our friend. Uh, and I'd like to dedicate this episode to Danny Faulkner, good friend, a great dad, a great husband. And he wasn't a modeler, but... Uh, uh, we're all going to miss him. And that's kind of pulled my mojo down over the, over the last couple of weeks. Hopefully, uh, all of us in our friend circle can uh, take a step forward together here in the future and uh, remember Danny in the way that he needs to be remembered. He was, he was a great, great person. You know, it's nice that you remember him and it's the memories that keep the people alive. Well, what's going on in your model sphere? Well, uh, you know, like I said, the January rolls around, the work picks up. Uh, I'm... I think I've mentioned previously on episodes that this pandemic for a lot of people has slowed their work down for I'm in one of those professions that it's sped it up. And after the new year hit, I've just been inundated at work. And thus, I, I you know, I'm, I'm moving 90 miles an hour at work. And by the time I get home and, you know, have dinner, take care of family and all, it's, I, I'm finding that I'm having a tough time keeping the mojo alive. I'm I'm actually having to work at keeping the mojo up, which uh, which hasn't been the case uh, much of late. Ever since we started the podcast, it's kept my mojo going, and uh, I'm I'm, ha it's, I'm fighting for some, to find some mojo. So uh, hopefully tonight's episode will definitely help lead there. How about you? Well, I've mostly been working on getting the gear sorted out for remote recording. Hopefully, uh, that's in our future here this summer, if not maybe fall of this year. Hopefully summer, hopefully sooner than that. But uh, just uh, picked up another microphone. I'm going to be working on another one. So we'll have uh, have three at least. Yeah. So once we get out in the field, we can uh, talk to some people about uh, scale modeling and their mojo. Uh, well, I mean, Indy is still scheduled to hold their contest in April, and unless something changes, I don't think the the lockdown rules in Indiana right now, they, they would allow a contest. So assuming nothing bad happens, we may get to record, do our first one up in Indy, and I, I'll tell you what, I'm looking forward to it. So, uh, Mike, what are you drinking tonight? Well, I'm finishing up the last of a little Elijah Craig uh, small batch. Good bourbon. It's, uh, it's good. I like my bullet better. It's a. Uh, it's pretty good. I, I don't. I can't think of anything remarkable in it that, that that's a standout. I mean, it's a pretty, pretty, uh, pretty straight bourbon. I mean, it's a little oaky with a little caramel. It's just not. It's not got anything that's really jumping out that makes it anything particularly special. But for the price, it's a. Uh, it's a pretty good one. I think that's about on the same price point as bullet, right? Yes, but the bullet's got a lot more rye in it, and I think it's just got a little bit more flavor. Darren at Model Geeks 
was showing his uh, stash the other night and I, I, we, we saw that bottle and uh, I told him, I think I'm going to get, I think he picked my next one. So I got this one and it's like I said, I'm at the last of it. So <laughs> obviously it was, couldn't it was make, good enough. Yeah. It couldn't be too bad. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, what about you, man? What do you got going on? Well, um, I am sipping on a Guinness extra stout. Now that's kind of unusual for me. Uh, I don't particularly like dark beers. However, you know, when it's cold and wintry out, uh, a heavier beer is kind of warming almost. And you, I've got nothing, even though dark beers are not my cup of tea, I've got nothing bad to say about Guinness. Smooth, very drinkable. It is comforting on a on a cold winter's night. So this and this one's definitely going to get me through the podcast. Now you know you sent me a picture. That's the extra stout in the bottle, not the pub draft stuff, either can or bottle, right? That's, That's the, that is correct. Okay, just checking, which is yeah. what I prefer as well. When I get that, I, I don't buy much of that, but uh, I know what you're saying. Yep. Well, I hope it gets you through the episode. I, I de- it definitely will. If you doesn't, you can just open another one. Yeah, I, w- I may do that. <laughs> well, we've got a little bit of listener mail this this episode. Well, good. Not well, you know. I think we did get as much, but a a a big subset of it uh, kind of revolves around the same topic, which we'll get to toward the end of this. But I'll get into the ones that are kind of standalone. We got uh, Juan Pablo from Tucumán, Argentina. So that's a that's a long way from here. Hmm. So good to hear we've got a listener in Argentina. So thanks, Juan. Appreciate yeah. that. Uh, he offers one caveat to it's just a kit. Get another one in the vein of, you know, don't be scared. Start it. If you mess it up, get another one. Just kind of says that price may make it hard for some folks to uh, do that or, or anyone with a with a higher end kit, actually. And I, I understand that. But he says the mindset's a good one. You know, don't, don't be scared. Just jump in there and, and try it. But you might not want to go full bore with that on everything. I, I can understand that. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, I guess my the point of that is nothing. Nothing we do is irreplaceable. You know, true. Yeah, and you know, it, it, in in the scheme of things, modeling is a relatively inexpensive hobby uh, compared to say golf or bass fishing or some of those other things where the amounts of money we spend on our hobby look like nothing compared to what people spend even as beginners in those hobbies. But the, the point is well taken. There are modelers across the economic spectrum and, you know, some of them, the, the discretionary hobby money is not unlimited. So, but in general, the attitude is nothing's irreplaceable. Nothing is the last kid of its kind generally. And there's always True. another one out there if if you need to. And he also has got a couple of uh, topic suggestions, and these are kind of interesting. <laughs> How about a, topics addressing long hills truce that are not, such as gloss coat before decals? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, well, I'm not touching the gloss coat debate with a 10-foot pole. Um, <laughs> I think that one's been uh, beat around the block a few times. <laughs> and if, if, if people are really interested in – the uh, the necessity of glosses before decals. I, I would suggest uh, you check out Will Pattison or Paul Budzik's take on that. It it it's yeah I, he's he's right to a point, but yeah. I think what the the underlying well I'll use his word the caveat to that is how smooth your actual paint finish is whether it's gloss or matte or whatever that's underneath which is probably the it gets into like macro versus micro texture in the paint finish. And if you got a lot of macro texture in your paint finish and you try to do it without gloss, see, I'm going there. I'm going there. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't do this. That's all right. I, I don't know. I, I Again, Will Pattison, Paul Budzik, go check out their videos. See what you think compared to what you're doing now and uh, go for it the way you want to go for it. Now, I know what you do, so go ahead. What yeah. do you think? Well, I've, I've seen people who, who are able to do it. Uh, and I think you're absolutely right. The 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 level of smoothness of the finish of the underlying paint really has a ton to do with whether or not you need to gloss coat before putting down decals. I am never that confident, and so therefore I always gloss coat. And to be honest with you, it for me serves other purposes. Uh, 
a lot of times I'll use an acrylic gloss coat so that I can do things like oil dot filters and stuff like that, where you want that barrier to the underlying finish. So it serves it serves multiple purposes. But I do agree there are people. I mean, you can't disagree because there there are plenty of uh, YouTube videos out there of people doing exactly that, applying decals directly over paint, and it works for. It. So you know if it works for you, that's fine. His other topic suggestion is the uh, honesty or lack thereof in kit reviews. Uh, you know, he brings up a, a kit that a lot of people are raving about. Is to me is forty eight scale Spitfire, and uh, in his opinion, at thirty nine parts, the the cockpit is over engineered, and he thinks there's some underwhelming fit here and there in that kit as well. You know, my take on this is if I'm really kit reviews typically don't make or break a purchase for me. Uh, because of the way I build and what a kit represents to me uh, in, in the process of getting a model at the end. But that said, uh, when I do look for kit reviews, I really try to find independent kit reviews. And by independent, I mean that uh, reviews that are in places that don't get ad revenue from the hobby industry. Well, you you bring up exactly what I was going to say. Technology has democratized kit reviews. Anybody with a cell phone and a free YouTube account can do kit reviews. Whereas in the past, in the old days, you had to rely on reviews in magazines that were ad supported by manufacturers and distributors. So there was good reason to question whether or not the editorial side was independent of the advertising side. Now, if you want to find out about uh, the Tamiya Spitfire, I can guarantee you, you can go on YouTube and find at least a half dozen reviews or builds of it. And and technology has has done so much for us in the hobby that we don't even, I think, fully realize. And that's one area of them. Next up is Brian Schultz, and he says he's from the frozen tundra of Wisconsin, and I bet that's really true tonight. Mm-hmm. Uh, Brian dips his toes into every genre of modeling if he thinks it's a cool subject, and he wonders if some people don't get stuck, uh, I guess stuck meaning uh, lose their focus, lose their mojo, uh, building just one thing or building in one scale. Uh, that's an interesting observation. It's probably person-dependent. I will say, I don't know that ever I got stuck building only 35th scale armor. The, the subject matter wasn't why I got in a rut. It was changes in the hobby and stuff like that. Uh, but uh, I tell you, I'm building a second 72nd scale float plane right now, and I'm, I'm enjoying that. And that's, that's certainly uh, throwing some extra kindling on the fire. So I, I think uh, we've, we've talked about this a lot, actually. You know, we, we did a whole segment on scale and genre crossing yeah. and maybe we'll, maybe we'll have to do another one sometime and, and our our best three or four has that as a as a topic heading so i strongly recommend folks uh take a little diversion outside their comfort zone and try something they might not not normally build well there in in there's actually even a nickname for, for this uh inside the hobby they call them a palate cleanser if either you're bogged down and you've lost your mojo in whatever your project happens to be the the one in your scale and genre that you're building and you find yourself bogged down or let's say you've just come out of a big uh you know long-term scratch build detail project and you've just finished it up and, and and done with it there is something that is restorative about taking something that you normally wouldn't build building it out of the box not investing time in research and all of that, just kind of st- almost like you're stretching before the next before the next match. You know, you're just uh, seven hundred scale submarines did this for me a number of times. Little seventy uh, second scale uh, ar- armor or soft skin kits also are a palate cleanser for me. You know, when I come off a big project and I finally put it off the shelf before diving into the next big project in my scale, which, of course, 
defi- definitionally I care more about, sometimes I'll just say, you know what, I need a, a, a three-week project, something small, something not complex, something not in my area, and just slap it together and paint it for for the relaxation of it. And, you know, it kind of cleanses the palette before you go on to the next course. Well, for me, this this E16 Paul comes to mind, but as I wouldn't call it a palate cleanser because I've, I've tried to do, I've actually tried to learn a lot from this and, 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 you know, it's not built out of the box clearly. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's been a, uh, I don't know what to say, a, it's been a vehicle to try things that I was not going to be able to do building an armor kit. Some of them. Ironically, I'm, I'm having the exact opposite experience with the M30 or the exact same experience with the M30. I'm going to do things like color modulation, chip paint chipping, dust dust and mud that really in 72nd scale aircraft, there's not much call for. So it's a chance for me to try stuff that otherwise I might not have ever tried. So Plastic Model Mojo highly recommends you divert from your norm for a little bit and try something new. Absolutely. What's your plan for getting better? Exactly. Up next, Michael Iluzzi from uh, another one from the Jack Wislick Polish Coast Watchers IPMS chapter. Obviously, he, he heard the uh, the last listener mail from the last episode where we mentioned this IPMS chapter, and he appreciates our support and promotion of the IPMS and our complimentary words about the leadership, conventions, and contests provided by the IPMS USA. So that's a good thing. Yep, absolutely. I, as I tell people every ep- episode, IPMS uh, USA is a worthy a, a worthy operation, and uh, the local chapters are a great great place to meet modelers who you're going to relate to. So I highly recommend it. If you, there's a chapter nearby, drop in and pay them a visit. Well, he goes on to say our namesake, uh, Jack Wislick, was the heart and soul of the chapter for many years and a well-traveled kit seller and trader. He often said, quote, if the coast is clear, we can deal. <laughs> Jack's pride in his Polish heritage, his enthusiasm for IPMS conventions, and his determination to help IPMS members get the most out of scale modeling, and his, and his enthusiastic, quote, dealing when the coast is clear, led us to the chapter name Polish Coast Watchers. So there you go. Yeah, well, that's nice to know. That is nice to know. All right. Well, we also heard from a few uh, new folks and some some repeats. Uh, Eric Simmelmayer, Joel Sherwood uh, have written in before. They're regular listeners. Um, John Oshaka from uh, Pahrump, Nevada, and Christopher Church from Springdale, Arizona, and uh, Paul Caridi from Melbourne, Australia all sent some really, really great comments about episode 30 and our, our talk with John Miller from Model Paint Solutions. Yeah, it was extremely popular, extremely... Uh, well, I had no doubt John is a, a an amazing, talented guy who not only understands airbrushing from the modeler's point of view, but because of his background, he understands a lot of the chemistry and physics of how what's happening behind the scenes that the normal modeler isn't thinking about. And uh, I knew people would enjoy it. He gives the last two IPMS nationals, he's given airbrushing seminars, free airbrushing seminars. If you're registered for the contest, you can go and attend these seminars. If you're in Las Vegas for the Nationals there, I'm sure he's going to be doing it again. I highly recommend it. And uh, we're going to have John back on real soon to talk more because we've only scratched the surface of airbrushing. And then again after that. And after that, that's right. (laughs) More on that later. Well, I'm going to go back and uh, revisit the last name I mentioned. Paul Caridi from Melbourne, Australia, asked a question on top of his his, uh, comments about episode 30. Uh, What is slide mold injection? Which is a good question. Yes. Typically, in historic plastic injection molding, even... You know, vintage kits typically from the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s even. You got a right and left mold half and they 
they separate along one axis. So the mold and the parts breakdown has to be constructed so the mold can separate only in one direction or along one axis. What a slide mold does, it creates mold tooling that opens and closes in a direction that's usually orthogonal to that. So if Who you imagine some big words like orthogonal, <laughs> well, 90 degrees to, to what, uh, to the primary axis or the primary direction yes. of mold separation. And what that does is it allows you to mold undercuts that you couldn't mold only pulling the mold apart in one direction. It allows you to mold round shapes that are actually round instead of, uh, you know, a, a long cone or a, or a shallow cone, hard, hard to explain. Typically, when you pull a mold apart in one direction, anything that's in the mold direction has a, a, a draft angle on it. So if you imagine a, a flat surface with a cylinder extruded off of it, and you're separating that in the mold, that cylinder that's coming off that surface does not have the same diameter at the base as it does at the top. Because if you did, it would never come out of the mold. There'd be too much friction between the two parts. So that that cylindrical shape has a larger diameter at the bottom and a smaller diameter at the top, and it probably has a draft angle of about one degree on it. So it's not really a it's not really a a cylinder. It's cone. Uh, lots of times it's in is not perceivable, but uh, on short short run tooling, a lot of the tooling that came out of Eastern Europe in the nineties and early two thousands, the draft angle on some of those things was really really severe. Uh, just because of the the technology they were using, but uh, slide molding gives you another way to to get around those limitations. Um, there's also things called lifters, and that's a whole different topic. But um, that's kind of how it works. So, slide molding lets you at its at its greatest mold a, ho- a completely circular hollow tube. Yes, it um, does. you can. You know, with the normal aircraft. Um, fuselage is molded in right and left halves that you assemble. With a slide mold, you can mold the complete fuselage, all the whole tube, and it's hollow in the center. The slide goes in and out of the center, thus allowing you, instead of molding two halves, to mold the complete fuselage. If any of you out there have the Fine Molds KI-43, uh, one of the most amazing things about the kit is that the fuselage from the back of the wings to the tail is sli- is a slide mold, and the fuselage is one complete piece, one complete hollow piece. And it, it's an amazing piece of molding. So, Paul, that, that's what it gets you. It it gets you a lot better kit and a lot fewer parts sometimes. Yeah. And it does allow you to to get parts that couldn't be molded any other way, like uh uh a lot like an F sixteen fu- uh canopy. An F sixteen canopy has it's a it's a a bulb that actually undercuts back to meet the fuselage. And with a slide mold, you can actually get that shape. Whereas if you didn't use a slide mold, and what they used to do is they cheated and just made those things slab-sided instead of molding the undercut. Exactly. That's that's a good example, actually. Yep. Well, that wraps up the listener mail for this week because so much of it was wrapped up around uh, episode 30. But uh, we appreciate all the support and feedback we got from that episode. And yeah, you're going to hear more from John Miller. I promise you that. Absolutely. Well, that was some good listener mail, Mike. Now, that leads me to ask the listeners. uh, We appreciate the mail. It really does help us a lot. Something else that helps us is if you would, when you're done listening to this episode, if you would go to whatever podcast app you use, you listen to us on, and rate the podcast, and we'd appreciate it if you give you give it five stars because it drives up the visibility of the podcast, and we get new listeners. The other way we get new listeners is word of mouth. The best thing for us to get a new listener is have a current listener tell a modeling buddy, "Hey, you need to check this out." If they need a little help figuring out what a podcast is and how to listen to it. 
we'd appreciate it if you'd help them do that. So uh, we've seen a, a growth in our audience and we'd like to see it continue to grow. And you all are the key to do that. So we'd appreciate it if you would. And while you're doing that, please check out all our friends out there in the model sphere doing doing similar shows. We're all a little bit different, but uh, we're all talking scale modeling to our own uh, to our well, to our own special way. Um, please check out on the bench from Australia, just making conversation from the from the UK, a scale model podcast from Canada, and Plastic Posse podcast and the model geeks from right here in the USA with us. So we pretty much got the uh, the bulk of the English speaking language covered there i think but uh, we're bringing you a lot of content uh, all the time so please check it all out in addition to the podcast we've got some friends out there blogging or vlogging on youtube uh, model airplane maker from chris wallace out of canada sprue pie with frets from our friend Stephen lee and inch high guy from jeff groves all doing some great blogs with their own take on things and if you like vlogs please check out the scale canadian tv from mr jim bates out on the west coast who happens to be canadian but he lives uh on the West Coast in the USA, and we hope to have Jim back here pretty soon, too, I hope. Yep. Uh, finally, as mentioned in earlier in the episode, uh, IPMS is a great organization. They have local chapters around the country, whatever country you happen to be in. They also have a national organization in, in I think, every country. If you're not a member of IPMS USA or IPMS Canada in Canada or IPMS Australia in Australia or wherever you happen to be, please consider joining the national organization. It's usually not very expensive. There are usually some benefits like a magazine. IPMS USA's case, you get a really great magazine called The Journal. In IPMS Canada's case, you get what I consider one of the finest modeling magazines out there called RT. So if you're not a member, consider joining. The benefits are great for you and they're great for the modeling community at large well it's countdown to vegas time how long we got at the time of this recording dave we have 191 days we broke 200 all right yes to the ipms national convention in uh, sunny las vegas nevada bob sent me a note uh, not a lot of updates but he says the rooms of the rio continue to exceed all expectations they've topped the uh, 2900 mark for uh, room nights booked that's a lot that is a ton. And says the excitement con- continues to build in defiance of current events. And he thinks folks are going to come if, even, if they, even if they have to wear a hazmat suit. So <laughs> hopefully it won't come to that. <laughs> That's the way I feel, man. <sighs> Trophy sponsorships st- still keep coming in, but there's plenty left. Again, get your name on the wall of a perfect stranger before it's too late. Sponsor a trophy package. <laughs> uh, another another big sponsor. They picked up Vallejo as a major sponsor. So if Vallejo is listening, I uh, assume that's Vallejo Model Color. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your support. They've uh, provided some great items to choose from in the raffle. So that's that's good news. And in general, Las Vegas is slowly coming back to life. So, uh, you know, he wants folks to check out the website for stuff to do in Vegas, non-modeling related, family related, whatever, and just check it out and and, and uh, plan on attending. It looks like uh, things are shaping up for a great show. Just hopefully all this will clear the way so they can, can have that great show. Yep. Yep. I am looking forward to it. I'm telling you, I'm like a... Uh, like a like a, a a drunk who's been without a drink too long. I I have I missed uh, with no no show in Texas last year. I'm start my palms are starting to sweat. I'm starting to starting to get the shakes. I need I need a model contest, man. I need it bad. <laughs> well, hopefully soon, man. I do too. Give me both. I said we got off to a false start last year. We had one show, and that was it. In the meantime, when you go to modeling shows, you're going to need to to take finished kits to display. So, uh, what's your bench to- what's your bench top look like? Well, almost dusty, but but not quite. I, I've made a little bit of progress. The Zis two, the fifty seven millimeter anti tank gun I'm working on, the mini art kit. Uh, after I got all the oil work done and the wash on it, pin wash and the oil work done, I, I, I found a I found a seam I'd missed on the split trail. So I had a little bit of negative modeling to do. So I had to go back and touch up with putty and paint uh, a seam I'd missed. But I got that, that ended up going off pretty well. Got the seam all fixed, got it touched up, got the oil blending all done. So the base coat oil work is done. Now I just need to start weathering the full thing and start moving that moving that on down the line. The uh, E16A1 Paul 
not much has happened. Well, that's what I put in the outline, but that's not exactly true now. <laughs> also a little negative modeling on that one too. Uh, I was Uh-oh. handling it. I was handling it uh, last night and I'll be damned if the, the, the upper fuselage seam between the end of the cockpit and, and the vertical stabilizer, it opened up a little bit from pinching it probably. I had to hit that with extra thin, let that dry a day. And then I puttied it again with Tamiya putty and I've got it all fixed. But I still need to rescribe those leading edge panel lines around the gun ports and uh, get that done so I can prime it. So I, I need to move forward because the longer this thing sits, the more crap's going to happen to it. That's not uh, related to the actual finishing of the model, apparently. Well, it sounds like uh, at least you, you've, you've had some nice saves if you haven't made actual quote unquote progress. I have, and hopefully that's the last of it. I'm really, I want to get these wing wing panel lines rescribed on this thing so I can get this thing primed. I think uh, there's a couple other seams that are teasing me a little bit, but I think there's just show through from the thin primer coat. So yeah, we'll, we'll see. I'm ready to put a real primer coat on it and uh, start thinking about painting that fool thing. It's, uh, <laughs> it's teasing me with these seams. <laughs> can't, can't what wait, about you? Can't wait to see it. Well, um, Okay, perfect honesty here. I have not done the last two weeks again. Uh, the demands of work have really stepped up, and so by the time I've gotten home and gotten to the bench, you know there are a lot of nights where I'm sitting there staring at it rather than working because you know modeling does take some mental effort, even though. One of the one of the benefits of modeling is your ability to kind of turn your mind off to the outside world and just relax and model. But if your mind is exhausted, it's really hard to pick up a, a kit and doing do things. It's not. I I have been moving forward. the The mosquito is. Uh, the sub-assemblies are all done. The interior of the cockpit has been painted and weathered. I'm, I'm ready to move forward. And all of my progress in the last two weeks has been on the Mosquito. And here's the honesty part. I tell myself that it was, well, I wanted to work on the Mosquito. But part of it is the next steps for me on the M30 are well outside my comfort zone. And I have been unconsciously or unconsciously shying away from taking those next steps because I like what's happened on the M30 so far. And honestly, it's there's that mental block of not wanting to screw it up as I move forward. So I don't touch it, which of course is stupid but it's a real thing that you have to combat and I'm combating it. And I have made a vow that in the next seven days, I am going to move forward. Uh, the next step on the M30 is pin washing and I'm going to get the pin wash on and done in the next seven days. Well, sounds good. What about your, uh, your bomber killer, your, your bare metal plane? The TU-128, actually, because I've been uh, I've been working on the uh, Mosquito so much, the TU-120, the TU-128, I really have not touched in two weeks. Now, part of that is I've ordered a reference book and it's uh, on its way in, so I should I should have that. But uh, really, it's more the fact that the Mosquito kind of picked up steam on its own once I started. Uh, being afraid of the M30 monster in the corner. And so I put my effort into the M30, but the TU-128 is still there and it's still going to move forward because I'm going to do a bare metal finish and if it kills me. So, uh, Mike, it's February. It's a little bit of the doldrums as far as model announcements go. Uh, oh, but no, it's there not. are new, <laughs> well, maybe we would have said that up to today. Uh, we, it, we had a certainly had a very timely announcement. So why don't you tell me your, your faves? Well, my first fave is a high ticket item on my wish list from last year and this year. Um, and there was a rumor that this company was doing this kit and I hinted to it last episode, but I, it was really all hearsay. 
I, I, I didn't know one way or the other if it was true or not, but uh, IBG out of Poland has just announced a Polish 7TP light tank. And for Yay. me, this is huge. This is this is a hole that definitely needed to be filled. This is uh, the Polish, what the Vickers six ton evolved to once it uh, was accepted in the Polish armament industry and, and what they did with it after that. So it's the, the Polish incarnation of a Vickers six ton light tank. But uh, it is, I'm, I'm really excited. I, yeah, I'm going to buy at least two of these, I think. <laughs> we'll see. It's got to be better than the, the kit that's out there now. That's all I got to say. Uh, that came across my feed this today. Yeah. Like midday today, 10, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock a.m. And yeah. I was like, oh, man, there it is. All right. Thanks, guys. Going to gonna buy that one. I'm excited. I'm excited to death about it. That's a great, great kit release. That's been long overdue. Well, you you and I may have to do a buddy build of it because oh, we may I have certainly, to. That's a good idea. I, I am certainly interested in doing a 7TP. I'm interested in doing uh, a couple of pieces of Polish equipment, the TKS, but the the seven TP, uh, definitely, definitely a a uh, a winner. And IBG has done really good stuff. So there's every reason to believe that IBG is 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 not going to trip over to themselves on this, and will end up with a very nice seven TP, long overdue. Well, let's hope so. Yeah. Even if it's sort of nice, it'll be better than that Spoinia Polish kit that's been out there for 30 years. It has it has to be. Has to be. You got a top fave of recent announcements? Well, besides the 7TP, uh, one of my faves is, and can't believe these words are coming out of my mouth, uh, Tamiya announced that they are doing a 48-scale F4B. This is going to be a wildly popular mod. A lot of the kits that the of the Phantom are that are currently out there are a little bit long in the tooth, and this you can. The other thing is you've got to believe that this is going to be molded in such a way that it's the first of a series. So you would have to think that eventually Tamiya is going to release the entire F4, or at least a good portion of the F4 series in 48 scale. So, uh, yeah, listen, I tease the 48 scale guys a lot, but I couldn't be happier for you. Uh, this is definitely needed and definitely going to be something that uh, I think is going to make, to me, a buttload of money. Well, and you've got your fine mold 72nd ones to fall back on. So you can, Exa- exactly, exactly. I'm not, I'm not feeling bad about it. So yeah, no, everybody gets, everybody gets their kit. Everybody gets a phantom. Yeah, that's right. Phantoms for, it's like being at Oprah. Phantoms for you, phantoms for you, phantoms for you. So uh, what other faves have you spotted out there? Well, I'm going to double up with ICM Corporation out of uh, Ukraine, I think. Mm-hmm. Their 2021 catalog was put out in its entirety on uh, the Modeling News web blog. Yeah. And it's just a testament to the state of the hobby industry being, we've said it before, and the other podcasts have said it before, or their guests have said it before. We're in the golden age, really, literally, for for subject matter in plastic kit form. So... ICM last year announced a FCM 36 French light tank in 35th scale. Now they've announced the German martyr conversion of that tank chassis in 35th scale, which is an ugly, ugly vehicle. (laughs) (laughs) But why not, right? Exactly. Ugly does not mean you don't want to build it. In, in addition to that, there's several other releases, but the, another standout is a, a French Lafley uh, V15T artillery tractor, artillery tow truck. So that's kind of obscure. It's a World War II French artillery tow. Who would have thought? But it's uh, Well, and I would assume that the Germans probably ended up using them in re- like they did everything else uh, at some point. Probably. It just makes me wonder, you know, 
to build it in its French configuration, what are you going to tow? What are you going to tow? Uh, it's a lot of tractor to tow that old Heller 25 millimeter anti-tank guns. I don't think that's what it was intended for. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it makes me wonder if, uh, and maybe there's a kid out there I don't, I don't know about in plastic. I don't, I don't know, but, uh, it's an interesting vehicle, this obscure German self-propelled gun and this French artillery tow vehicle. It's kind of interesting. And they've got a couple of British trucks, you know, larger, larger, uh, capacity of British trucks they're going to do as well. So ICM's kind of, kind of working the friends and coming out with some, some really, really interesting things. You got, you got anything else? Yeah. And this one, I'm going to my 700 scale ship guys, uh, Meng Model just announced in the last couple of days that they are going to do a 700 scale kit of the uh, Chinese the the uh, Chinese carrier Shandong. So we'll finally have in 700 scale a uh, a kit of the uh, latest Chinese aircraft carrier which will definitely fill a hole for the modern modern 700 scale ship guys. So you got a yawn, Mike? You know, I'm going to be nice this episode. Um, <laughs> th- there are plenty of kits out there that don't interest me, but there's no standout stinker among them, in my opinion, right now, at least f- from the stuff I'm, I'm watching, armor, armor mostly. So no, I don't think so. There's not a yawn. There's, you know, stuff that's not going to interest well, me, but nothing I'm going to, nothing I'm going to dog or drag down. What about you? Well, I'm going to give a yawn to ICM because they came out with this entire catalog and had just tons of announcements in 48 scale aircraft and 32nd scale aircraft and 35th scale armor. And do they show any love to the 72nd scale aircraft guys? No, no, they don't. And for that, I'm going to give the entire ICM catalog a great big yawn. (laughs) <laughs> well, I think we have def- different opinions on that catalog. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Our special segment tonight is entitled Red Threads, Uniforms and Gear of the Red Army. And uh, this kind of comes about from my, my other hobby, which is military collecting. I've been collecting Red Army militaria since about, oh gosh, it's probably 25 years now. I think so. And yeah. At what, least. what I mean by that, it, it is original material, not, not reproductions. And I've been doing this, yeah, about 25 years. And we, we thought it might make an interesting topic to discuss. So you've sent me a few questions and I'll let you, I'll let you drive this and I'll be the, I'll be the interviewee. You got it. Well, first of all, let me tell you that Mike is going to be much too modest for here on out. Mike is, Look, I'm a 72nd scale aircraft modeler. I don't have a, I have a general interest in World War II and a general interest in the Russian front, but no particular interest about Soviet uniforms and stuff like that. But I will tell you, um, Mike is one of those guys who has a real interest in a subject to the point where he has devoured the knowledge on it and has the ability to impart it in a way such that even if you're not, it's not your thing, it's still endlessly fascinating. Uh, Mike and I have had conversations around this uh, a number of times at military shows or at model shows. So sit back, relax, and I'm going to ask him some questions. And I think even if, if, Soviet World War II uniforms are not your thing. You will find points of interest in this. So, Mike, let me start by asking the very general question to you, which is describe the overall Soviet World War II uniform uh, development from, you know, 39 or even pre-war, 37, 38, the major points of development all the way through the end of the war. Well, to do that, we actually have to go back to 1935. Ooh. Okay. So fairly, fairly, yeah. Way in the pre-war. Five years anyway. Well, four, if you count what they did in Poland, but uh, 
in that time span from 1935 to 1945, which is the, the period that I focus on in my collecting, the Red Army underwent four revisions to the to the uniform regulation. Now, the first one happened in 1935, so clearly there was something going on before that, but that's of little consequence to my interest. But in, in 1935, the uniform regulation called for well, you had essentially trousers and a blouse, and the blouse, the Russian word is gym, gymnasterka. I'm not going to use that very much. We call it a blouse because it's easy to, easier to say. Uh, and this, this blouse was uh, it, it predates the 35 regulation, but but in 1935 it was a a a, sh- a blouse that was worn with the tail out of the trousers. Uh, it had a stand and fall collar like a like a shirt you would wear today, uh, with rectangular collar tabs on it. And the collar tabs were in the branch of service color. There's a color for each branch of service. And you had enlisted men's uniforms. You had officers' uniforms. And the enlisted uniforms pretty much had a plain collar with a collar tab on it. And the collar tab was, uh, for example, if it was an infantry unit or a rifles unit, would be a raspberry-colored base on the collar tab with a black piping along the outside edge. Now, if it was an officer in the command structure, a line officer, uh, the black piping w- would be replaced with a gold bullion or a metal thread braid. And if it was a, if it was an officer that was not in a in a command role, uh, like a logistical role or a supply role in, within an infantry unit, uh, it would still have the the black piping on it. And some of the other combinations are, uh, well, you had. Infantry, which is raspberry and black. You had cavalry, which was uh, a blue field with black piping. I think that's right. It might be black field with blue piping. One of them's engineers, one of them's cavalry. I, I can't recall off the top of my head. Then you had artillery, which is a black field with red piping. And you also and you had armor, which is also a black field with a red piping. But they were distinguished from each other. The artillery collar tabs were just black wool, like the regular collar tabs for every other branch of service, but the armor formations had a black velvet base to them. So they're not the same at 10 feet. They look the same, but at two feet, they don't look the same. You have a very nice, nicer looking collar tab for it. It's kind of, it's kind of ironic that in this kind of communist structure and the equality that, that they try to espouse through that, that you had a distinction between artillery and armor with this higher quality elite collar tab for the armor units. For an enlisted tunic or enlisted blouse, you just had the collar tab. For an officer's uniform, the cuffs at the uh, right on the sleeves, right above the cuffs, and around the collar point and around the back of the collar uh, would also be piped in the branch of service color. So it was a simple uniform, but it was it was really colorful, and that's what was going on in 1935. So if you have any questions, just interrupt me, okay? Okay. Nope. So now develop them forward go, from 35. So that, that uniform regulation lasted until 1940. So in 1940, there is a minor revision. Let me stop you there. So that means in 39 in Poland with the Russian invasion of Poland, also in 39, 40 in Finland, although I guess in Finland, they're mostly in winter gear, but you would have that 1935 pattern uniform. Absolutely. Yes. Top to bottom. It was pretty well gotcha. instituted because they had, had five years to get it into the end of service, which is a big deal. And we'll get to that a little more. So in 1940, they made a, a minor adjustment. The enlisted ranks for non-commissioned officers, instead of just a black tab with their rank devices on it, for the per the 1940 regulation, there's a red stripe down the long axis of the collar tab, and in the corner, the upper corner, furthest from the collar tip, on the collar tab for an NCO, was a either a a a, a gold laced bullion thread triangle or a metal triangle device that was pinned to the collar tab. That's the only difference. But so they didn't change the cut of the uniform at all. N- no, the cut was not changed. Just just the collar tabs for the uh, non-commissioned officers were changed. Now that 
never got fully implemented because of what happened in the summer of uh, 1941 kind of well, what interrupted what that. happened in the summer <laughs> what happened in the summer of 41 that would have been of interest to the Soviet Union's military forces well they they kind of got caught a little off guard and they got got invaded by the Germans i think everybody knows that uh, operation barbarossa happened and the red army was caught in a kind of a logistical disarray so the uniforms were mostly the Model 35 and 40 is a, is a mix because the Model 40 regulation was never fully implemented. So to back up a little bit, typically the enlisted uniforms were issued in mass with no insignia on them, and the insignia were issued separately, and the, and the individual sol- soldiers sold them sewed, sewed them on. Uh, the officers' collar tabs or the officers' uniforms were factory finished, so. If you could look at a officer's M35 blouse versus an enlisted M35 blouse, there's a little bit of tick up in quality with the officer's grade uniform. They're, they're still very simple, but that's that's one minor distinction between the two. What happened after the German invasion was that it just got really hard to maintain all this branch of service color, and it, it also made the uniforms really colorful. So they went to a subdued collar tab for both enlisted ranks and officer's ranks. So for 1941, the uniform cut is pretty much the same, 35, 40, 41, unchanged. Enlisted soldiers wore a plain green collar tab on a plain green uniform with very little distinction on it. NCOs might have their rank devices on there. They may still be red, which was the color for 40 and 40 or 40 and 35 regulation, or they might be green. They may be, they may be red, but painted green to cover up the red. Officers' uniforms were the same way. Uh, they subdued the collar tabs and everything just tried to go to a base green to, uh, to get rid of all the color. So that's what kind of happened after, after the German invasion, when the war production started. And then what? As the war progressed for morale reasons, to some extent, uh, the uniform cut was changed and the rank system was changed. So in, in January of 1943, the uniform went to back to the czarist era stand collar where, where the collar just buttoned up on your neck straight up like a, like a ring around your a ring around your neck. Uh, and they went back to shoulder boards instead of collar tabs. Cause there's, there was no collar anymore. And the, it's kind of interesting because the shoulder boards were, were a, a big identifier back during the, the Bolshevik versus the white army, the Imperial Russian army battles during the revolution. I mean, the, 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 the shoulder boards were, absolutely a czarist era bit of symbolism. So to go back to that in 1943 was, was a really big deal. But the, uh, now when they went to the shoulder boards, were they just uniform color or did the shoulder boards carry the rank insignia or the branch of service color? Yes, the answer to that is yes. They they did carry all of that. There, there, but there were two types of shoulder boards. There was a a field shoulder board, and there was a dress and parade shoulder board. So for an infantryman, just a regular ground pounder, it would be a a green base shoulder board with the raspberry piping for the rifles branch. Now, that same rank and same branch of service for a a parade or a walk out or, or more formal uniform, it would be a raspberry based shoulder board with black piping. And that kind of carried on through with that, the branch of service like armor and artillery were a green field with red piping for the field uniform. They were a black field with red piping for the parade uniform or the formal uniform. So that's kind of what happened. And, and the, the interesting thing about the, the uniform change in 1943 was that it it took some time to roll that out because the army in the, the Soviet army the red army in 1943 was getting to be huge and they all the, they had all the logistical problems you might expect from that with a war going on and so you had in photographic reference you can see people still wearing the M35 cut of uniform with no collar tabs but wearing shoulder boards for, per the 43 regulation. So their uniform did not have the cut of the 43 regulation, 
but it had the insignia structure of the 43 regulation. And you, you see that all the way to the end of the war. A lot of things get distorted in photographs because so many of the Soviet photographs of the era were staged and were they were they were they were meant for publication in their in their their war newspapers and things like that. So you tended to see the the best of the best. You'd see fully equipped units being photographed. We had the full blown M forty three uniform with M forty three insignia, and you didn't see much of this hybrid stuff, but more and more archival photographs are coming out that show that um, these hybrid uniforms were really, really common uh, in 43 and 44, particularly. Well, that leads me, you know, we're modelers here. So I'm going to ask some model related questions. And, and the first one is if you had to pick one manufacturer of, of, of figures that does Soviet world war two figures, that consistently gets uniform details wrong, either mishmashed or just completely wrong era, or you know who who's the manufacturer who's committed the biggest sins in regard to the figure kits out there? Well, in in plastic, I don't think there is one. I think I would have to lump all the aftermarket resin manufacturers, you know, the small okay. shops. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> And typically what has gotten incorrect is probably the biggest gaffe for, for Red Army miniatures, Red Army figures, uh, is most people familiar with Red Army uniforms know that the, the trousers had reinforced patches on the knees and the blouses had reinforced patches on the elbows. That uniform trait is an enlisted uniform trait. The officer's uniforms did not have those. So t- typically uh, what I'll see is a resin figures that's got an officer's uniform who's got all the other trappings of an officer's uniform. It'll have those coffin shaped patches on the knees of the trousers. That's, that's not correct. Um, or the elbows of the, of the, of the blouse. That's not correct either for an officer. Another thing that's a little less common is that they'll intermingle like post-war equipment into World War II subject matter which is an easy thing to do because a lot of it didn't change a lot, but it changed enough that if you know what you're looking at, you know, it's not right. What type of equipment, uh, canteens, uh, uh, ammo belts, what, what? One thing that comes to mind in plastic figures is the, the mini art box art for their Soviet figure sets show, show an ammo pouch for the Mosin Nagant rifle series that the coloration of the pouch in their illustration is a post-war pattern that, that what they showed did not exist for world war two era, era ammunition pouch. Now, another one that comes to mind was a, a resin or white metal figure that came out gosh, a long time ago. It's when I was writing the red threads column for our, for our club newspaper newsletter. I can't remember the manufacturer, but uh, the red army had a string type backpack. You know, what a string bag is, yeah, Your kids probably have them. They they get them at science yeah. fairs and all this stuff, right? Well, there was a yeah. a pack that the Red Army used that was basically a string bag like that, and the wartime version was really plain. It had a strap system on it and the bag, and that's pretty much it. The ones used by the the Soviet Army in the post war era actually had a pocket sewn on the outside of it, a small pocket for for whatever. And this particular figure I'm thinking of had that pocket on that string bag, which was the post war post-war thing so just small details like that is typically what you see most most of the plastic figure companies get it right now some of them are better than others and there's certainly some of the resin manufacturers are better than others but uh speaking of that if you were to choose a manufacturer mike is doing a a a soviet diorama who who would you look toward both plastic and resin to use their figures Conf- just from a uniform standpoint only. The best plastic Soviet figures right now are, are the sets from Masterbox. They they do a lot to get things right, and they, they just have a lot of subject matter. I like them because they do a lot of the earlier, the M35 uniform cuts. Uh, a lot of the other plastic figure companies, most of the Tamiya figures, uh, the, the uh, well, it was TriStar. I don't know who makes them now, but most of their figures were, were the later vintage. For resin, it's, it's Stalingrad. Yeah. 
Stalingrad's miniatures are hands down probably some of the best Soviet figures out there. And I've, I've really been pleased with what they've been coming out with. That leads me into a subject that, that you and I've had a discussion about before that I really, I've got to say, was completely unaware of until we started talking about it. <clears throat> Talk for a minute about Amer- American-made Lend-Lease supplies to the Soviets that made it into uniforms. I will be honest with you, when I think Lend-Lease, I thought trucks and tanks and airplanes. I didn't think uniform pieces and fabric and shoes and stuff like that. But talk for a minute about what the U.S. supplied to the Soviet Union that made it into their uniforms. Well, it's it's quite a bit. It's, it's quite varied, actually. Well, the simplest place to start is footwear. We supplied a particular style of garrison boot it was a style of boot that was not worn by U.S. servicemen in, in combat theaters. It was it was basically the the service uniform boot you'd worn around base during peacetime. And we supplied I don't know how many, but qu- quite a few pairs of those boots went to uh, went to the Soviet Union. They're a kind of russet brown color, smooth on the outside. Um, I've I've got a pair of those in my collection. They're they're not too hard to find on the collector's market out of the East, out of the Baltic, out of the former Soviet Union. Uh, for footwear, that's that's about it. Um, would, the, would, the the, Soviets, would the Soviets have issued those as footwear for frontline troops? Yes. Okay, so you could see a Soviet soldier in Soviet 35 or 40 or 41 pattern uniform wearing... American American boots. Yeah, American low boots. These are like, you know, gotcha. three quarter length boots, just ankle boots. Gotcha. So gotcha. I, I don't I don't know how common it was, but uh based on based on my experience in the collector's market, we sent a bunch over there. I, I don't know how many actually got used. They could have stayed in military stores for all I know for, for eternity. Um I know my pair has never been worn, uh, but they did come from Estonia, so they, they had to get over there somehow. The the next the next topic is uniform cloth. Now the United States sent bolt after bolt after bolt of uniform cloth to the Soviet Union, and it was almost entirely what uh, you collectors call U.S. mustard wool. It's a light olive colored wool uh, that was the basis for our World War One era uniforms, and it was also used for the trousers for the dress uniform in the United States up until uh, early forties, I think. So uh-huh. there was a lot of this in surplus. This material went to the Soviet union and it was used to make blouses is used to make trousers. It was, used, it was used to make headgear, both visor caps and uh, side caps. So Soviet uniform items made out of that material, typically after 1943 is fairly common actually. Another thing you see to a lesser degree is uh, what uh, we call HBT or her- herringbone twill. It's a cotton, a cotton f- right. fabric with a with a with a, a herringbone pattern woven into it for strength. Uh, I've got a pair of Soviet enlisted trousers that are made out of U.S. herringbone twill twill cotton. That's not very common. Uh, sometimes you see a blouse made out of that. I don't have one, but uh, it's it's not unheard of. Another interesting one is the the olive green poplin material that uh like the US M41 field jacket was made out of and the uh the paratrooper uniforms American airborne uniforms was, were, were made out of uh, not real common. I've got probably the most interesting I have in my collection made out of US poplin is a pair of quilted winter trousers. The outside shell is made out of US poplin. And the inside is made out of sh- American sugar bags from various American sugar companies. So if you turn this trousers inside out and turn the pockets out, you'll see Spreckles Sugar Company on one of them. You'll see Hershey's, which is an American chocolate company, from, from the sugar that was sent over there. So they used the, the, the bag, the cotton bags the sugar came in uh, to use for uh, liners and uniforms. Wow. Not, not, real, not real common, I don't think, but... Uh, yeah, I snatched those up when I found them. 
that's amazing. Well, it, you know, it 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 goes to show that uh, you know the the Soviets needed just because, as you mentioned, how huge the Soviet army was. Uh, that that the, the need for the logistics to produce uniforms to even clothe the the soldiers just had to be almost almost an impossible undertaking. So were there any other things that the US supplied uniform wise? Uh n- not really uniform. Well, not the US. Now there's some British items that you you, you, you kind of see the same thing from the English side. Um you see a lot of Soviet greatcoats that were made from uh what's called uh British battle dress. It's a it's a brown color, battle dress wool. Their their military uniforms we're cutting a d- distinctive shade of brown, and you'll see you'll see Soviet overcoats made in that material. Um, occasionally, something else like a pair of trousers, but it's, it seems because it was heavy wool, so mostly overcoats. R- really uncommon. The, the you, you you're probably familiar, but the in World War One and the early part of World War Two, uh, the the British Army wore sometimes these leather jerkins, yeah, which is a vest, a leather vest with no you know no sleeves. Um, they supplied those to the Soviet Union. I've got one of those in my collection. It's got Soviet buttons on it. Really? Speaking of buttons, I wanted to mention, ask you about that. Did the U.S. supply Soviet pattern buttons to the Soviet Union? Uh, yeah, we, we supply both uh, brass buttons and uh, the resin buttons. Now, the, the resin buttons are in an olive plastic. If, if, you look at a, if you look at an American enlisted man's overcoat, great coat that he w- would wear in the field in the wintertime, um, it's got American Eagle seal buttons on it and they're cast in a, an olive colored plastic resin. Uh, you, you'll see those same buttons in all sizes with this star hammer sickle on them that are made in the United States uh, for supply of the Soviet Union. You'll also see brass buttons in all the sizes that the Red Army used for coats, shoulder boards, blouse buttons, brass front, and on the back it'll have an American, an American uh, manufacturing company on the back. You also you also see British ones. Another thing I, I failed to mention before we we're talking about the Lend Lease part. Very limited. You will see an entire uniform item made in the United States. I have a an M forty three Soviet M forty three blouse that was made by the Russell Uniform Company in New, New York City from top to bottom, everything about it. Hmm. But you say that was uncommon? Yeah, I think that's fairly uncommon. It, it may have even been been made for an adjutant that was in the United States. I, I don't know. I don't know how much of that actually went over to the Soviet Union or if it was made custom from somebody who was in the United States at the time. Well, all this lend lease discussion and the discussion of the different materials – leads me to the next obvious question. What color is Soviet uniform green? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a hard one because you've got so many different uniform types. But if we just look at the ones who wore green uniforms, if you look at the pre-war stuff, particularly the 35, 1935 regulation stuff, factory knew there were really two, two types of green. Uh, there was a, a typical kind of brownish olive, a, a darker olive color that most of the enlisted uniforms were made out of. Now it started out pretty dark, but it was cotton and it faded really quickly to a, you know, a more beige or khaki color. There was another uniform color that I, I haven't been able to pin down how common it is based on what's available in the collector's market in, in this era. But uh, it started out as a, a much bluer kind of a green a sage green kind of color if you can imagine that yeah and it it faded quickly to to a greenish gray color so you kind of got those two things going on but most of them were olive and any shade of olive tan khaki uh for the enlisted stuff most of the officers uniforms were wool which had a lot better um color fastness so most of the officers uniforms the blouses are, are are a pretty dark olive green uh as are the trousers. Now, pre-war M35 era, M40 era, the officers' trousers were actually contrasting color. They actually they were actually blue. So they wore a blue trouser with a green green blouse. Right. And again, mostly wool. Um, but there are officers' uniforms in cotton as well. They're just a little bit higher quality. And but the gr- the greens kind of I wouldn't say all over the map, but it's 
it's it's varied and, and I think a modeler can get if you, if you stick to the olive shades I think you're going to you're going to be okay and you know throw some var- variety in there if you got s- seven figures on a diorama base don't use the same color green for all their all their uniforms kind of lighten it and darken it as you see fit and you'll end up with a pretty good mix well and as the war went on uh, especially once the, they became under logistic pressure and because they were getting lend-lease cloth from either Britain or the United States. I assume that it's quite it would be quite common to see a soldier wearing a, a uniform, a, a blouse and pants, and the colors be, uh, I don't want to say radically different, but noticeably different that they're that the especially you know in 42 and 43 when things were really rough for the soviets that that uniformity of color in the uniform pieces wouldn't necessarily be have been the first priority uh that's that's certainly true and i another modeling tip would be to mismatch the trousers and the and the and the and the blouse because it, it take even take the lend lease out of the, out of the equation. I don't. The lend lease uniform items aren't terribly uncommon. Uh, I wouldn't. I would not say they're rare in the collector's market today. They're but they're typically the later uniform cuts. Forty three, the forty thirty five, forty forty one. Uh, yeah, all, the enlisted uniforms and cotton. Yeah, the 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 blouse and the trousers are, are likely going to be mismatched colors to some degree in in terms of shade of olive. That would be gotcha. very common. Gotcha, and it's a great way to add visual uh, interest to to the figures on a diorama. Oh yeah, certainly. Now, at the risk of going down a giant rabbit hole, talk a little bit about Soviet helmets. Well, that's not too bad of a rabbit hole, actually. If if we're looking at nineteen thirty five to nineteen forty five. The Red Army went through three models of steel helmets. And at 10 feet, two of them are identical looking. So the first one is the Model 36 helmet, or in, in the collector's world, at least in the in the non-Cyrillic alphabet world, it's the SSH-36. And the SSH is the phonetic abbreviation for, for Stalnoy Schlem. That's almost correct. But Stalnoy <laughs> is is steel, and Schlem is hat or hood, uh, so that's what that is. Stalnoy Schlem is steel hat, steel hood. Uh, the Model Thirty Six is the the helmet with the the crest on the on the on the top, and the and the long brim in the front, and the and the droop over both ears. It's a really nice looking helmet. Uh, the steel on it's kind of thin, but it was the it was the, it was the helmet the Soviet Union adopted in nineteen thirty six and. Uh, it lasted, it wasn't challenged as a, as a military item until 1939. Uh, so it was worn, you'll see that helmet in the pre-war. You'll see it in Poland, certainly in 39. You'll see it in Finland in 40. And you'll see it into, into the first part of World War II on the Eastern Front. Uh, 41, 42, 42, they, they probably started getting fairly uncommon. But then if you go out east in Manchuria at the end of the war, uh, you might start seeing those show up in photographs again because a lot of those units out there were kind of isolated, so they may not have got the the latest equipment. That helmet in the collector's market is kind of rare and expensive. They're they're out there, but uh, they're getting kind of pricey. But uh, it's kind of a I, I kind of consider it the the last evolution of the French Adrian helmet because under under that crest on the on the top of an M thirty six helmet or SSH thirty six helmet, there's a vent hole. Just like on the mm-hmm. French Adrian helmet, gotcha. And there's there, there's certain aspects of the liner construction uh, that are very similar to the French Adrian helmet, but you know it's a lot bigger helmet. It's a lot more modern looking helmet. Uh, but it it got supplanted later by the SSH thirty nine, which is the the big bowl shaped dome helmet uh, that most folks who think of Red Army can visualize. That helmet was adopted for serial production per its name in nineteen thirty nine. It was manufactured up until sometime in 1941, and uh, it's it was probably the most common helmet when the Germans invaded the Soviet Union in 1941. 
and those helmets are they're just big round helmets the shell came in three sizes they're painted 4bo green per the documentation we have and it's a uh, it's kind of the ubiquitous uh, red army helmet now in 1940 that helmet went to be simplified and became sshh 40 and the, really at, at for most eyes at, at 10 feet the only difference in a in an sshh 39 and sh 40 is that the 39 has the liner's held in by three rivets and on the 40 it's held in by six because the liner is completely different but uh, the shape of the shell is the same uh the color of the shell is the same uh one thing i might add about the 39 is from 39 to 40 and maybe almost into 41 there was a stenciled hammer sickle star on the, on the front of the front of that helmet and the, the model 36 helmets were were the same as well they also had that insignia on the front, but after after forty or forty one, that that star on the front was dropped for for combat units. Gotcha. Now I assume you see the same color variation among helmets uh, as to a greater or lesser degree than you would among uniform pieces. Well, the interesting thing is the the Model thirty six helmets made pre war are a lot darker shade of green than those made after 1939. Uh, it's, it's interesting. Um, there's, there's a pretty good book on Soviet helmets that came out of Russia several years ago. And in, in the text of that book, they talk about the Model 36 helmets being painted in this protective green, but they don't call it 4BO. But when they get to the Model 39 and 40, it's 4BO green. And the, the two shades are completely different colors of paint. Now, for the dark green color, there, you don't see much variation. And even for the lighter green, what the the, the documentation calls 4BO, uh, you see some variation, but it's it's more in the weathering and the age of helmets that are contemporary today that that are survivors. It's it's not so much. I think it's less factory variation. It's more age and weathering variation. Uh, they're they're fairly consistent actually. Hmm. Now this this 4BO on these helmets, assuming it's it's the same 4BO that's on everything else. Is definitely on the yellow side of the green spectrum. Um, it's a fairly, it's a fairly bright color when when new. There's unissued examples still of these helmets out there, and it's a, it's a fairly it's a fairly bright green. Uh, hmm. Definitely on the yellow side of the spectrum versus the kind of the blue side of the spectrum. I guess anybody with passing knowledge of Soviet insignia. We always think of that classic cloisonne red uh, star with a hammer and sickle. Did combat units actually have much in the way of metallic insignia on their uniforms? Well, actually, yes. The winter hats, the ushankas, the the side caps or the polokas, and then the visor hats, which I don't know the Russian word for. Most of them certainly before 41, but even after, uh, had a red enamel star on, on the front of them. They were, they were steel struck, washed in brass or plated in brass. And then they had the cloisonne red enamel in them. There was, there's examples of subdued examples where they just paint, paint over it with olive paint. Uh, there, there are cheap ones that are just struck in steel and painted olive from the start. I've never seen wartime that actually had olive colored enamel in it. That's kind of a, a post-war thing, but, uh, but yeah, those those uh, those cap insignias were carrying that red enamel t- from from the beginning of the war to the end in large degree. Okay, so the, they didn't. That wasn't a, a a thing that went away due to production demand. So a guy in forty four issued a new uniform would have that same some version of that same insignia issued to him. For the most part, yes. I, I think most of them were still red. A cap insignia. That's what I'm talking about. Is cap insignia. Uh, yeah. But there were right. subdued examples, and, and that was that was also getting used used a lot. But for, for the most part, yeah, that those red those red cap insignia were uh, were still fairly prolific for the entire war. One more question. We're we're going along here, but one more question. The Soviet, the classic Soviet tanker's helmet, you know, that soft cloth padded tanker's helmet that, uh, you know, the the armor units wore. 
what color were those? <laughs> well, the version the versions pre war were were cut in black leather. Leather. Yes, the, really? the, the pre war helmets are, are leather helmets, and they're they're black leather helmets. Now that that's that's a gaff you see a lot. You see a lot of modelers making brown leather Soviet tankers helmets. And uh, I can tell you, after 25 years in this hobby, I'm going to go out on a limb and say there's no such thing as a as a brown leather Russian tankers helmet. I hope I'm wrong because I'd love to see one. But the, yeah. the Finnish had a similar helmet that sometimes people think is a Soviet helmet that was captured, but it's not. It's it's an indigenous Finnish helmet uh, that was a copy of the Soviet helmet, but it's not a Soviet helmet. And they are brown, but the Soviet helmets are not brown. They're black. Now, once the war started, you start seeing those helmets cut in black and dark gray and even olive green canvas. Gotcha. And th- those are the most common. And, and in, the, in the collector's markets, that, those aren't really that hard to come by. Well, they're a little harder than they used to be, but uh, um, they're not not terribly rare. And, you know, there's there's a winter cut helmet and there's a, a, a all other seasons cut helmet. The, the winter helmet is cut deep under the chin with a really wide flaps on both sides to button under the chin. And the whole thing's shearling line is all lined with the sheep's, sheepskin. Uh, of course, the... the, the the helmet for all the other seasons doesn't have that, obviously, because it'd be too hot. But uh, uh, there, there are two styles of Soviet helmets. There's a winter winter helmet, and there's a all other seasons helmet. Hmm. Okay, just finally to to wrap this segment up, um, what would your advice be to modelers who are modeling Soviet figures from World War II? Is there a particular reference that you go to? Is there uh, a particular piece of advice that you have? What What do you say to the to the modeler out there who wants to do a figure with a Soviet uniform? Well, the first thing I would do, I'm going to plug a a book. It's called The Soviet Soldier of World War II. It's published by History Collections out of France, and the author is Philip Rio. And Philip's a good friend of mine. And it's a very, it's not a high level book. Well, it is. It's a high level book. It's a a high level look at Soviet uniforms. It's very photo intensive. History and Collections publishes Military Magazine, uh, which is fairly prolific magazine in the the military collecting world. And it's just a good reference to show you the progression of the uniforms and what was being worn when and uh, just what those things looked like. And you need to be mindful of, of what, what you're trying to portray. A lot of people put Model 43 uniforms on subjects that are much earlier than that. So you need to kind of watch out what you're doing. Check out the mini art figures. Check out the, the master box figures if you're into plastic. And the Stalingrad figures are, are phenomenal. I mean, they're, they're probably the best out there for, for accuracy and uh, content as far as World War II Soviet subject matter goes. So I highly recommend those. Okay. A final question. When you finish the ZIS-2 finally and put it on a display base, are we going to have any Soviet figures with it? I haven't decided yet if I'm going to have a a German captor looking over this gun he just overran. I'm not sure what I'm going to do with that yet, but uh, it's a good question. We just have to wait and see. All right. Well, we'll all be waiting to see. So, uh, Mike, uh, do you have any any shout outs for this episode? I do have some shout outs for this episode. I'd like to shout out to our latest uh, Plastic Model Mojo supporters. We got some new supporters. Uh, Mr. John Allen and Christopher Church are, are new to us in the last two weeks. And we got some ongoing supporters, Terry Wilkinson and Alex Restrepo from our home club there. Alex, appreciate that. Uh, have uh, have uh, been uh, throwing us a bone every so often. We appreciate those repeat uh contributions thanks guys thanks to everyone and if anybody else would like to join these guys in supporting our show you can do so at www.plasticmodelmojo.com in the upper right hand corner of the home page is a heart icon uh, you can use that you can use that to make a paypal donation to our cause and we really really appreciate it uh, we've been flattered by the amount of uh, contributions we've had coming in so thank you very much well, uh, my, my shout out uh, for, for this month is to uh, Dr. John Miller at uh, uh, Model Paint Solutions. Uh, John agreed to come on and 
do the episode last time on airbrushing. I've been bugging him for quite a long while to do that, and he finally agreed. And um, it was a fantastic episode. If you haven't been over to Model Paint Solutions' website, go there, take a look. Uh, not only does he sell airbrushes, paint, supplies, stuff like that, he has a lot of tutorial articles, a lot of review articles. Uh, it's a really good website, worth a visit. Well, I'm going to add to that, and I'm going to announce right now that uh, Model Paint Solutions will be an ongoing sponsor of Plastic Model Mojo. And we Yay. thank we thank John for that, and it's just we're going to have him back on a fairly regular basis, and uh, expect more uh, good airbrush mojo to come from uh, from John. Absolutely, that's fantastic news. Got any more shout outs? Nope, that's it for me, Mike. I think we're getting a little long in the tooth here. Well, not compared to last episode, but uh... <laughs> well. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that one was I think that that one was intense. I think the, I think the next one with John will be just as intense as well. So, I guess yes. we are getting along in a tooth, and we probably ought to wrap this up, Dave. So, uh, as they say, so many kits, so little time, Mike. See you next time. All right, we'll see you next time.